So you just see a big lab, right? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So um, yeah, I was. I will try to do this quickly because I know Elizabeth has other things to do. <laughs> so um, I will do this as quickly as I can. There are 31 slides, but I'm going to skip through some. So um, for me, when we started this, um, we decided we wanted to do this as a club and not send things off to a lab. And one of the biggest challenges was figuring out sort of logistically how to do that. I know lots of people are, Alan Rockefeller is, Stephen Russell is. But one of the biggest issues was that we were not going to have a dedicated space. We weren't going to have someone's kitchen or a dedicated space to do this. And I come from a background of being in a lab. This was a lab that I worked in um, for several years where you set up PCR. Um, you can see that middle bench. You set up PCR under a little hood. It's all very clean. You're very, very careful. So I had some nervousness about how this was all going to work. Um, even the lab I work in today, it's not quite so fancy, but this is our bench. We have a small scale for measuring out things like agarose. We have our equipment. It's all there. You're not moving it. You can have heavy things like our thermocycler next to the shelves. Um, so trying to get to what this was going to be was, was sort of the biggest challenge for me. Um, and I think we've actually done really well. So this is our lab. It fits into four Rubbermaid boxes. Um, we pretty much have in there everything that we need except for things that need to be chilled. So we also have a cooler and we have a thermocycler that's kind of heavy that stands alone outside of that. And so that has allowed us to go wherever and um, do those parts of the process that Annie talked about. So here we are at our last DNA sequencing event. Um, Anil, Tom, and Zay are processing the samples, taking little bits of fungal tissue and putting them in tubes that we will then extract the DNA from. Sarah Nell is in the back entering data and Annie's going through samples. Um, and so, like I said, I was kind of indoctrinated into this world of be very, very careful with your PCR. It has to be super, super clean. You have to be very careful to get good results. And I've been pleasantly surprised by some of the really great results that we've gotten. Um, the numbers aren't perfect. It's not been 100%, but we, we've gotten some really good results. Um, Annie did mention this. Um, for whatever reason, the biggest hurdle seems to be making the gel and having a nice gel that gives us good bands. Um, I switched to using these agarose tablets. You add them to water. They've already got the agarose. They've got the um, sea green dye that binds to um, double-stranded DNA. They've got the TBE in them but we consistently get this smear above the bands. And I think it's just because there's so much dye in the gel that whatever DNA is left in our DNA extraction is high molecular weight and sits up there and we get these smears. And so in this case, if we were answering Annie's quiz, we would send lanes one, two, three, and four in for sequencing, not five and six, but seven and eight. So what have we found? Well, we extracted DNA from 118 samples and did an ITS-PCR on all 118. Of those 118, 75 had bands and were sent for sequencing. Uh, that represented 61 different taxa. So that's um, from genera to species to something we only identified as fungi, um, about 50 different genera. And that's complicated as well because each genus can have its own sort of little requirements. ITS is a universal barcode, but it doesn't work equally well with all genera. And so if we're sequencing or extracting DNA from and doing PCR with everything, um, we can run into some challenges. Of everything that we sent for sequencing, 42 yielded sequences of high enough quality to analyze. And I don't have... Um, any trend yet as to which genera are failing for us and which are working well. So for example, we sequenced eight Ammonida samples and four worked well and four pretty much failed. So I don't know if that was the samples or um, if that was something else. Um, Annie mentioned gels and this was an early gel, which is really nice. Um, and that's our first quality control. Did we get a PCR product? It's very hard to tell looking at the band, whether it's something that we'll get good sequences from. And so that's where we get that number of having sent off 75, but only 47 that worked really well. Um, because you look at these bands, the first one we sent off for sequencing, 
it came back really nice, clean sequences. It was a Letoporus persicinus. Um, the second one we did not send off. The third one we sent off, it was an Ammonida. The fourth one, same qualitative band, but it had really high background, and I'll show you that in a second, and we couldn't align it. That was an INAT idea of Gymnopus. I don't know if Gymnopus is prone to that. Um, the next one was good. It was a Ganoderma. The next one you can see is bigger. And so this was a longer sequence. We got clean sequences, but we kind of got them from different ends. So we have one here and one here, and we can't align them. Um, so that's that can also be an issue. Um, and then our other one was good. And then this is our control, which is nice and clean. So when I say high background or that we couldn't align the sequences, this is what I mean by a bad sequence. So you can see that these peaks correspond to base pairs. And as the DNA is going through the, um, the Sanger sequencing machine, um, these are from little fluorophores that have been put on and the machine calls them out and sees as it goes past, oh, I think that's a T, I think that's a T, I think that's a G. So these nucleotides are being called out by the machine as it's watching these go past. But here, it's really hard to tell, even though the machine has called out certain nucleotides, you can't really tell whether this is actually a G or maybe it's a C or maybe it's an A. So these are some of the ones that we've gotten back. And that can be caused by different things. Someone asked about ITS copy. Maybe we have multiple copies of the ITS. Maybe we were actually um, amplifying two different things. Um, different things can happen to cause these issues. This is what we want to see. And this is what we have seen in a number of our samples. Very clean sequences, nice bands, nice height, no background. Um, so that's been great despite not having a lab to do this in, despite not having you know, all of the equipment, we've been able to get some really good sequences. So of the 47, I think it was, um, we were able to confirm 19 identifications to refine another 19. Um, we have two that are really interesting. They have no gen bank matches um, that are greater than 87%. And we had one contaminant, but this was a sample that originally came from dog vomit. So we didn't have a whole lot of um, expectations about that one. It was a poison center sample. Um, so when I meet, when I say confirmed, for example, this was um, an ammonite phylloides that Mitch had identified from the poison center. And so he had this dried sample um, and I don't know how long he'd had it for, but he gave it to us um, just to see, could we, uh, extract DNA and amplify from it. Um, and actually these worked really well. And so we um, extracted DNA and got sequences. And um, this was our blast result. Um, I don't think I have time tonight to show the blast process. So maybe some other time we'll talk about that. Um, but you get this sort of list of hits. And so what BLAST is, it's basic local alignment search tool. And you've got your sequence and it's looking for other sequences that match with that. And so in this case, we have um, our cover is 100%. So ours matched along the length of the sequence we compared it to matched 100% and our identity was 100%. And if we click on that one, that's an ammonite of phylloides that we're comparing it to um, that came from a mycoflora project. So we have some, um, we, we can have some confidence in this um, entry. There are a lot of things in GenBank. Anybody can put sequences in GenBank. Anybody can put whatever name they want on whatever sequences they put in GenBank. And so um, just because you get a top hit, just because you have a list of names, you have to do some extra homework to make sure that what you're looking at really is reasonable and that it's a good sequence to compare it to. Um, you know, if, if you've got a mushroom and you want to identify it, you're not going to go to Flickr and look for pictures that happen to be in Flickr of mushrooms that someone put a name on. You're going to go to a guidebook or you're going to go to something else that gives you some confidence. Um, I, this one was an auricularia. We confirmed it as auricularia. Um, this was our list. In this case, we've got a lot of different names. That makes me wonder, are there synonymies? Have things been synonymized? Or is there not that much differentiation between the ITS region? Um, 
And that's when, as Annie mentioned early in the ID table, and luckily she and I picked different things to focus on, um, that's when you go to the literature and you try to find papers that people have been working on, um, your genus of interest or your fungus of interest. Um, they looked at a ton of different auricularia samples from around the world. And I bet once we have analyzed ours, it will probably fall in this complex up at the top, but we have not done that yet. In some cases, we were able to refine the ID. So um, this is in there now as Agaricus griseocephalus. When we first put it in, we called it an Agaricus. It has the free gills of an Agaricus. It has um, pink gills when it's young. This first picture doesn't show that so well, but there is another picture in the um, INOT observation that shows the free gills and, and one that's not quite so eaten. So this was one of our very first specimens that we collected. We got the ITS region, it was pretty good. And when we blasted it, having just put on a name of Agaricus spa, the top hit at 100% was Agaricus griseocephalus. And just down a little bit was the Agaricus griseocephalus from type material. And that's always a good indication that you're comparing your sequences to something that has been well characterized in this case, the holotype, so there's nothing better. When I looked back then in iNaturalist, at that point, Annie hadn't put in her Agaricus griseocephalus. So there were only two um, in iNaturalist. And, you know, iNaturalist isn't everything, right? There are lots of things in iNaturalist, but there are other databases. Um, so just the fact that there were only two and now three observations was kind of interesting. Um, it's a recently described species, but not that people aren't putting that name on very commonly. Um, I went over and looked at Mushroom Observer, and there was only the one entry, which is the same from Texas as the bottom entry in iNaturalist. And then I went to a website called MycoPortal, and MycoPortal has um, information from herbaria around the world, and you can put in a name and see what herbaria have samples that have that name on them. And in this case, this is what came up. Um, the Texas sample, which was also Mushroom Observer and iNaturalist, uh, four samples, one from Utah, one from West Virginia, two from New Mexico, and then randomly two from Norway. And this West Virginia one is the holotype. So um, we were able to put a species name on this, and it also is the first record from Maryland and the sixth record in the U.S. as far as we can tell. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we were also able to kind of look at this one. This is a sample that if you go into INAT, it was kind of eaten. <laughs> that some of the characters had been removed by um, something. And we got some decent sequences from that. And that the top hit there was a xanthoconium that Stephen Russell has um, sequenced. So we don't really know exactly what it is, but we know that it also occurs in Indiana and that there's at least one other one out there that is very similar. If you notice here, the percent identity on the right side goes from 98 down to 92, we usually cut off genus at about 97. So these are probably not both xanthoconium. This is probably a different genus from this. So there's, there's all this diversity out there that still is left to be explored. And the more things we put in, um, the better we will be able to explore that diversity. This is the xanthoconium, which had purpureum on it, but that's what um, is the INAT entry here. Um, if you go down to the comments, he puts in the xanthoconium spa INO1. It's not really purpureum. So another one that we were able to refine was this from um, Sequinota. The name on it was Potocypha with a question mark. Not really sure, maybe. Um, and when we uh, sequenced it and um, looked into the DNA, that's a stereo stereopsis hissens. And Stereopsis hissens, if you look in INAT at observations, it's kind of got an interesting distribution so far. Eastern US, a little bit down into Mexico and Northern South America, and then some over in Australia and New Zealand. So um, does that just represent the location of people that are interested in these things, or does that have actually some biological, ecological meaning? One of our other really interesting um, samples was this Hygrospe miniata. And I think we had a Hygrospe miniata in the photo contest. 
Um, so after we sequence this, this is our top hits. And so the top hit is an uncultured hygrosity clone. That means someone probably was taking um, DNA out of the soil looking for mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and ours is 83% identical to that, which means not close at all. So um, maybe in the hygrosabaceae, but um, could be something quite a bit different. Um, in this case, uh, we could sequence the large subunit that can sometimes get you to family better than the ITS um, and do more work or just wait and see if anyone puts anything into um, GenBank that has a better match. So is it a new species or a new genus or is it just an underrepresented group in the databases? And we actually had something like that. Oh, um, I forget which one it was. Um, I was going to say it was the xanthoconium, but I don't think it was. Um, we had something that only matched like 92%, but then a month later, Stephen Russell put in a sequence that matches ours, something more like 98, 99%. So that was something that was just underrepresented in the, in the databases, and there are friends out there. And I can't have a talk like this without talking about my favorite micro, micro fungi. Tom likes lichens. I like the little things. So this is a um, little fungus that you find on oaks. And in the INOT observation, I've got some micrographs of the spores. Um, it forms these little leaf spots. And there's a structure on the underside of those called an acervulus that releases the spores. Um, and this is on a tree outside my work. But I see these little leaf spots on red oaks all over the place around here. Um, we got an ITS sequence, and this was the top hit, which is also very low. So it's not this, and this represents um, the first sequence of this fungus. In this case, this is not a new genus or a new species. This is something that's out there. It's just not represented in the databases because nobody sequenced it before. Um, so this is an illustration from the paper where it was described. So this is just kind of a, a list right now of things that we've been working on and sort of my working list of what's going on and, and what did we do with it. Um, and as Tom mentioned, over the next year, we plan to have maybe 200 more. And so we'll have a lot more information. Every single one of these, as Annie demonstrated, and as I quickly showed here, each one is a longer story. And once you start to pull on the thread, it sort of pulls you into a deeper rabbit hole. All right. This is that's it for my stuff. <laughs> that was really quick, but I wanted to finish. So, um, any questions? And you're still sharing your screen. Am I? Okay. <laughs> it's just getting like a. You didn't want to see <laughs> Zoom within Zoom within Zoom. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, April, I don't know if you've been watching the chat, if you have questions to ask from the chat, but also we're down to about 40 people. So people can probably just jump in with questions and we're definitely past time. So don't feel like you have to stay on to the bitter end, but if people have questions, I'm, I'm sure. No, I have encouraged Annie to um, mainly uh, just uh, respond to them in the chat. So I think, I think we mainly got them answered. And um, as you say, we are sort of dwindling numbers now, so. Um, I did have one question. It, you mentioned you didn't notice any patterns in terms of like we're certain um, species or genera not succeeding as well, but did, did, did your hit rate get better over the course of the year in terms of how many successful sequences you had not yet? Wait, Tom's no. shaking your head. <laughs> Tom thinks so. Um, I, you know, it's been kind of, it's, again, it's like hit or miss. We get these great bands and we send them in thinking they'll work and they don't. Um, and whether it's um, by genus, I have the feeling that in some cases it's certain genera are harder to sequence. Um, we are using primers that are, yeah, universal, but sometimes um, you need to go a little further into the ATNS region. Sometimes you need different cycling conditions. So um, 
you know, the ones that haven't worked, we could sort of gather them together and try a few things to see if we can get them to work better. Megan, you had, uh, uh, I think, refined the protocol to suggest that you were going to do um, dried specimens as opposed to wet specimens preserved in the, um, uh, I guess, directly into the little tubes that you were using. Did you notice a difference in doing that, or, or is that why you went to dried, that there was really no difference? Yeah, there's really no difference. And it was just an extra step and extra plastic and everything. So um, it's just easier to get everyone to dry things down. And what happens to the specimens that you end up with too much heat? For instance, I don't have a very well controlled dehydrator. And while I was trying to keep the heat down to uh, under 110, I may not succeed all the time. And I'm just wondering what it looks like when when that happens. Or you just get no band because the DNA has been destroyed. You know, we'd have to we'd have to double check on that because I don't think I mean, even the things that we have right now that people have dried, um, they haven't been dried under standardized conditions. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's added to why some things have worked and some things haven't. Um, so I can't say specifically. Does yeah. the DNA I, committee I have to add? Um, most of the specimens that we have um, processed right now, after the change going towards dried, have either been fresh that we collected that same day or that I've dried in my dehydrator. And I do have very tight controls to stay under 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's very little chance of uh, frying the DNA. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, um, it might help to put something on our website that indicates uh, some good dryers that are appropriate for doing that kind of work. Or one that ones that the DNA committee would recommend that we get that has better control on it. I can send that over. Thank you. No problem. I see Chris Wozniak has his hand up. Yeah, hi, Megan. I just had a question, and this is partly out of ignorance, but I'm curious. Uh, fungi that are dikaryotic or multinucleate, does this complicate the sequencing protocols? Well, of course, all the, most of the basidiomycota that we're working with are dikaryotic. And so um, what you end up getting is, Annie showed the process of PCR. Whatever the primers hit first is what usually ends up getting amplified. And so you sort of have this amplification bias that if it's hit a certain ITS region and made copies within the first three or four cycles, then those are what are going to continue being copied. Um, and so usually you can get pretty clean sequences, um, even out of dikaryotes. Um, you are probably not capturing the full diversity of the ITS region within each of the organisms. Um, and, and I saw your earlier question, and, and there have been a number of studies about what sort of um, what sort of, not misinformation, but what sort of biases are we introducing into the process? People do um, sequence with ITS primers and then take the um, results and clone them into plasmids. And then you'll have just that clone and you can um, put that into bacteria and grow up lots of copies um, and look at the diversity of ITS sequences. Um, but yeah, the, the, but basidiomycetes that are dikaryotic um, have worked just as well as ascomycetes that might be mitotic or that are haploid in most of their forms. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sure. Well, this has been great and it's exciting to see some of the results and just to understand a little bit more about the process. So thank you all for the work you put into this multi-part presentation. Yeah, I look forward to seeing what you guys are able to get done next year.